Good evening, and welcome to our first UM Democracy event. As you may know, the UM Democracy series aims to provide resources and information on things to know before the election this November. Tonight, we are focusing on disinformation and fact checking. My name is Keith Marzullo, and I'm honored to be the Dean of the College of Information Studies, which we finally call the iSchool. My co-host is Dr. Lucy Douglas, who is the Dean of the Philip Merrill College of Journalism. Our faculty presenters are approaching the topic of disinformation and fact checking from different angles, and each will be sharing a short TED style presentation with us. If you have questions during the presentations, please feel free to share them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen, as we'll have a Q&A segment at the end of the program. So let's get started. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jen Goldbeck. Dr. Goldbeck is a faculty member, a professor in the iSchool, as well as an affiliate professor in both the Computer Science Department and the Philip Merrill College of Journalism. Her core research interests are in understanding how people use social media to improve the way they interact with information. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jen Goldbeck. Thanks very much. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here to talk to you tonight. Um, and what I want to focus on today is sort of one element of the vast space of social media and how it plays into all the issues that we're concerned with. Um, and that's really kind of starting at the beginning of social media in the early 2000s and looking how that's evolved and how it impacts our ability to understand disinformation, credibility, and trustworthiness of sources online. Um, and so I know a lot of you probably weren't using social media back in the early 2000s, and frankly, there wasn't much of it. Um, so I want to give you a little picture of this. Uh, can you see, guys see my screen? Everybody? Great. Uh, so this is MySpace. <laughs> MySpace is, is sort of pre-Facebook, um, very popular among kind of high school and middle school students in the really right around um, the turn of the millennium into kind of 2005 and 2006. You could have all kinds of control over your MySpace page. Uh, so this is an example of one. Uh, I've got a couple other ones in here just so we get a feel of what a MySpace page looked like. So this is basically like the home page that you would have on Facebook now with your profile. Uh, except they looked like this. But they didn't just look like this. First, they auto played music very loud whenever you went to them. You couldn't really easily turn that off. In fact, sometimes the music was hidden, so you couldn't turn it off. And then they weren't just images like this, they were animated. Uh, when I was putting these slides together today, I found a MySpace template page left over from 2003, I guess, and it had all these amazing glitter animated GIFs. This is totally what MySpace looked like. Um, so it's a lot of like 13 year olds getting their very first taste of making HTML and animated GIFs and putting it all together to make these crazy profile pages. And it was really revolutionary because up until this point, if you wanted to put something online, you basically had to be able to program it, you had to have a server, be able to upload it. And this was the first time that anyone could kind of come in and make themselves a presence online. Um, I'm happy to talk more about it later, but in 2004, Facebook came along and Facebook looked like this and everybody's page looked like this on Facebook. Uh, you had your one profile picture and then there was a little table of information that you filled out. You couldn't post status updates. You couldn't really post pictures other than your profile picture. Uh, this was it. And all you did on social media at that point was make your own profile and then go look at other people's profiles. And so coming from this madness of MySpace, to having this option of Facebook was a little bit of a relief, right? It was such a relief to be like all the crazy backgrounds and animation and music and gifts are gone and we've got something that looks a little more sane. Um, and in fact, this was representative of what we expected a kind of credible website to look like at that point. Um, people had blogs and they could make them kind of look as crazy as they wanted, but you knew something was professional and reliable if it was a little bit tamer like this. And so I put that out there to give you a picture of what things looked like at the time. And I also want to take you um, in a minute to what all content looked like online, because I think this is important. We were really good at that point, and there was a ton of research at that point, 
on what are the visual clues that make something look reliable, look credible, look trustworthy online. And I think we still rely on some of those. So uh, this is the New York Times from 1999. Uh, this is pulled from the Internet Archive, and so they had images for their headlines at that point. Those are broken uh, right now, so that's where you see these little things here. But it looked kind of a lot like it looks now. Uh, it was narrower because monitors didn't have as high a resolution, but you can tell that this is the New York Times, and you, it still kind of looks like this, and this looks like a credible website, both in 1999 and now 21 years later. Um, if we look at sketchy websites. Um, so here's one called Conspiracy Planet. I believe this is the um, October 2000 issue of Conspiracy Planet. Um, doesn't look super credible and uh, independent of the content. It looks a little bit like somebody just threw this together. And this is the current issue of Conspiracy Planet. It hasn't been updated since 2018, but it's still out there, um, still sharing conspiracy theories, and it looks exactly the same. And if someone sent you to this as your main news source, hopefully you would be a little concerned about that. Um, so here's the issue. If I share Conspiracy Planet now on Facebook, which I did today, um, this is what it looks like. It looks like a standard Facebook post. You can't really tell a difference. And I wanna really highlight that because I think it's critical to a lot of the problems that we see with disinformation spreading on social media now. So here's a fake news site called Gateway Pundit. This is a right-wing fake news site. Uh, this is their page from this morning. So this isn't from the archive. This is just from today. And so I picked one of these stories from Gateway Pundit. And if you look at it, if I hope you're not shocked that this is a fake news site, right? This doesn't look like a, the site of like a reliable journalistic organization. It looks a little sketchy. And you can tell if you look at the website that there's some things there that you wouldn't expect, even from a local newspaper. Um, if I share that story on Facebook, it looks like this. Okay, so we've got the picture from the story. We have the URL, a headline, and then a paragraph underneath. That's, this is what it looked like when I shared it on Facebook. Uh, if I look at the Washington Post, this is a story from today in the Washington Post. If I go share that on Facebook, here's what it looks like. We've got the picture up at the top. We have the headline. And so here's what these three websites look like if we go actually look at the stories that are there. We've got the Conspiracy Planet story, Gateway Pundit, and the Washington Post from today. They look quite different. And I think if we look at these, if I asked you to rate which of them is reliable and which of them is potentially fake news, you'd likely have a pretty good guess. But when I share them on Facebook, they all look basically the same. They're put into this really standardized format, um, which makes them look very nice on Facebook, but all those visual clues to the sketchiness goes away. Um, and that I think is a really critical thing for us to think about when we're thinking about how does disinformation spread online? Because if I'm a, a sort of right-wing conspiracy theorist and I'm sharing news from a fake news site, the clues that are immediately there for you if you're looking at the website, are not there when it gets shared on Facebook. And we know, in fact, that most people don't click through those articles that they see on Facebook. So if I share one of those conspiracy theory articles on Facebook, you're going to read the headline, you're going to read the first paragraph, and then about 80% of people who share it will share it without actually clicking through to read the article. They're essentially sharing the headline and the photo. So, you know, that's not great information literacy, but we know that this is what's happening. And the sort of embarrassment or the shame that might come with sharing something that looks super sketchy, um, the reputational hit that you might take from that if you've got this really sketchy thing on your page, that goes away with the way uh, social media, and it's not just Facebook, most social media sites do this, standardize the presentation of these. So all those clues that we've looked at go away, and we know that people are a little bit lazy and they're often sharing things without clicking through to get those visual cues. And so the question becomes, how then do you assess the reliability of an information source on social media without having to do a lot of work. And that's something that we haven't been good at. We talk a lot about information literacy and training people on information literacy and how to dig into things. And I think most people who are reasonable could look at any of those sources and give you a good guess about if it's a reliable, credible, trustworthy source or not, if they click through to the article, uh, both from the visual clues and from what's written there.
But with the way that these things are presented on social media, all of those clues that we teach people about with information literacy go away. And we now have put this big burden on them where you have to click through and read a lot. And while sure, we want people to do that, the reality is that's not what's happening. And so I think this puts forward a big challenge in terms of design of social media, um, of the way we encourage people to share, which is something inherent on these platforms that has led to not such great results. Um, things are upvoted by people, but things are also highlighted by algorithms because of the way that they're shared without any clues for people to judge their reliability beyond their background knowledge. We need to do a better job of that. We need to think about what are the ways that we can enhance the clues that are available to people to make it easier for them to understand this because social media has stripped a lot of that out. And so I leave that sort of standing as a challenge that's going to, I think, complement what we hear from the other two panelists and the strategies that are out there, that we need to think not just about how do we fact check this, how do we teach people to interpret this, how do we automate some of this, but also how do we design that user experience to give people more insight. And so I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Dr. Kohlbeck. I've got to say, looking at those MySpace things brought back memories and not all of them were pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's a really interesting take on how we assess uh, information validity in, in a snap second and then how that gets hidden. Um, next up, we have Dr. Nemo Hassan. Dr. Hassan is a joint faculty member in the Phillips Merrill College of Journalism and in the iSchool. His research focuses on applying big data and data mining principles to journalism and computer science instruction. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hassan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dean uh, Marzullo. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Uh, okay. All right. So, all right. Is my slide visible now? Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Goldbeck. Uh, you gave a nice option for me to introdu introduce the fact-checking part. Uh, there are a lot of misinformation out there, as uh, Dr. Goldbeck mentioned, and people are trying to mitigate this problem. People are trying to solve this problem, and that's what we have the fact-checkers for. So what is actually fact-checking? It is the process of verifying information in order to determine its veracity and correctness. Um, and uh, people have been doing fact checking for so long, but uh, after the boom from social media networks, social platform net, uh, sites, and uh, other advance in computations and uh, internet infrastructures, we're seeing a boom of uh, misinformation and disinformation. So uh, to mitigate this challenge, uh, the, the rise of fact checkers are there. Uh, we often question ourselves, is fact-checking effective? Uh, and research shows that, yes, uh, fact-checking does indeed correct uh, people's perception uh, and uh, also discourage politicians from spreading false or misleading claims. Uh, there is a downside, though. Uh, research also shows that fact-checking sometimes backfires. It sometimes bolsters one person's uh, false uh, be a belief. So there are pros and cons, but apparently based on research, the pros are uh, way more than the cons. Um, so here's a quiz for you all. In last three years, what is the, uh, the number of fact checkers out there increased by what percent? 25, 50, 100? I will not keep you waiting. So here is the graph for rise of the fact checkers. So we see that in 2020, we have about 100% more fact-checking outlets uh, than we had in 2018, 149. And this is the scenario in the whole world, uh, not in the United States. So it shows that people are trying to uh, kind of catch up with the, uh, with the deluge of misinformation. The journalists are trying, the fact-checkers are trying. Uh, for instance, in the United States, we have factcheck.org, we have PolitiFact, fact-check are from uh, uh, Washington Post. We have media bias fact check. Uh, we AP also has a fact check a wing. However, even though we have about 60, 70 plus fact checking outlets in the United States, unfortunately, uh, it is not enough. So uh, we can ask ourselves: Is it because the number is small, or is it because for some other reasons? 
there are it's a, there are multiple reasons. Uh, Pew did a research uh, recently, and they found that uh, American people they uh, are they not all the time believe that fact checkers are unbiased. So Americans split on whether fact checkers favor on one side or not, and and uh, it, it is shown that the Republicans they tend to favor. Uh, they say that 70% of the time, fact checkers tend to favor one side, whereas Democrats believe that fact checkers are doing fairly uh, unbiased work. So even if we keep increasing the amount of fact checking outlets, if we cannot change some things here, if we cannot create the belief in the people that uh, the work the fact checkers are doing are unbiased or good, then there is a there, there will still remain a gap. And there is a curious case of a case of social networking sites, as uh, Dr. Goldberg mentioned, that Facebook and Twitter and almost all the fact checking, all the uh, social network platforms, they standardize the content shared in their platforms, and they are not doing enough to mitigate the misinformation. Uh, they are co communicating, they are co uh, collaborating with the fact checking outlets, they are uh, recruiting people to uh, manually check things on the internet, but still we see a lot of misinformation being shared uh, on these social networking platforms. Um, so how can we um, kind of solve or how can we mitigate, what is our role in mitigating this problem? Misinformation, disinformation is a big problem and we all need to add, we all have some role to play here. Um, uh, we, uh, for, from our side, we can be a little bit proactive. We can try to understand what are the types of misinformation or how, I, what, how misinformation spreads and what we can do to um, kind of tackle or uh, un detect that some information is true or false. Uh, just to give an idea, uh, there are different types of mis and disinformation. There are false connection uh, where the headline or the visual uh, does not capture or support the content. For instance, the headline can say, uh, Florida shooter supported ISIS, and you go to the actual article, the article doesn't have any evidence for that headline. Uh, there could be manipulated content, so the video is could be manipulated, the image could be manipulated. Uh, there can be satire and parody, uh, intentional satire, so we need to understand whether uh, article is non-fictional or satire or what. And the article could be totally fabricated and 100% false. Um, so uh, here is one example of uh, misinform uh, misinformation where uh, the headline is accurate, the content is accurate, but it is just that it is impersonating one famous person. Uh, so here the headline says, Gina Miller jailed for conning clients uh, out of 800k to fun, lavish life. Uh, any person who was reading that article could connect uh, Gina Miller with the UK politician Gina Miller. But in this case, uh, this genomela is not that UK politician, it's just another con artist. So sometimes we, and, and imagine if this was shared in the Facebook or Twitter, you could only see just the headline without the content and immediately you see, oh, my, my opposition party or um, the party I don't like uh, is kind of uh, taking fund and spending for lavish life. And you can share it without reading, and that's what happens is how misinformation can spread. So here, how can we detect it? One idea is understanding what, uh, what genome letter you are thinking of and looking at the article and seeing what genome letter you are about. The other type of, and this is more critical, of misleading claims. So here, the headline is saying, labor election campaign boosted by fake Twitter accounts, okay? Again, you just read the headline and you have a perception that, oh, Labour Liber Party is not good. But when you go and read the article, the, the article says both Labour Party and the Conservative Party, both of them were responsible for using fake Twitter accounts to boost their campaign. But it, it is only the Labour Party which mentioned the headline. So that is one type of misleading or information probably can be termed as disinformation as well. So we need to be careful when we uh, just take our build our perception from headline or share just up reading the headline. Uh, and sometimes uh, if you don't, and sometimes it's hard to tell whether an article is um, satire or not. 
And only after going to the end of the whole article or the whole website, you see it is rated as satirish. So sometimes we need to be uh, aware that um, an article which may look totally uh, believable, but we have to care, be careful whether this is satire or uh, intentionally made false or not. So some guidelines uh, are, are there to, uh, to find whether any information is misinformation or good information. The, the first tip that most of us uh, may already know of is paying attention to the domain and paying attention to the URL. So here is one image that has CNN News as a, as a logo here. And if we look at the image on our social media uh, feed, we may believe that this is coming from CNN because we don't, we don't see the link in our Facebook or Twitter, right? We only see the image. So yes, it is coming from CNN, but if you go to the news and if you see the URL, you'll see that this is not the CNN, this is actually CNN news dot something else, which is not the actual website. So but just after paying attention to the URL, you'll know that this is uh, not the actual website. Here is another example abcnews.com.co, abcnews.go.com. Both of them are very similar. And if you go to their website, I mean, the false one is not active now. If you had gone to the website, you would see that they are looking very similar. So the logos are same. Those are intentionally designed to deceive people. But if you are familiar with the URL, if you pay attention to the URL, you will understand that this is not coming from the actual website. Other types of uh, fact checking that you can do is doing uh, image search if you have doubt about an image. Uh, for instance, um, this image was shared in social media claiming that there was an earthquake in Turkey. But when you search this image in, in Google image, you find that this was not an earthquake in Turkey. There was, this was an earthquake in Chile. So by, by understanding, by knowing that there are options to uh, check images, just simply going to Google and doing reverse, reverse image search, you can avoid the, the shame of uh, sharing false image or false information. So if you have some doubt before sharing, or if, you, if something looks a little bit um, not accurate uh, before sharing, um, go to these tools, go to these uh, resources and do your own fact checking and uh, then if, it, if you find this is true, you can share it and let your friends and family know. However, uh, there are new types of um, technology coming which are allowing new types of fake information. So some of you may have heard of deep fake videos where uh, there could be one source actor who is just any random person saying any random stuff, but the video can be, uh, but the technology can uh, put it, put the words, put the actions, everything to another person, let's say our president's mouth, and it'll look like the president is saying what the random person was saying. So if you don't understand that there are ways, there are technologies to design to create these deep fake videos, you might believe on this uh, without knowing. So we need to be, under, we need to be um, aware of these uh, technologies and researchers are working to uh, mitigate this problem to automatically detect if a video is deep fake or not. And the, the big social network platforms, they are also investing on detecting uh, these uh, deep fake videos. Uh, some additional uh, tips in addition to what I mentioned so far. Uh, if something you want to share with your friends, if you feel the urge to share, check if the news was covered in multiple sources. If it, if it was covered in multiple um, pro mainstream media, if it is, then there might be a chance that this is true. Uh, check the timelines, right? Sometimes one news is shared just to match with the event going on. For instance, if there is any uh, riot going on, you would find people sharing news of riot that are from 2000 or 2010, right? So if we don't pay attention to the, attention to the time, then you might share some news of 2010, believing that this is actually happening now. So check, pay attention to the time uh, and pay attention to the published date. Also check the sources and citation in the news article. Uh, so a well-studied, well-researched article, a well-designed um, article should have citations, should have sources, uh, sources and references. 
uh, if it's not, then uh, you can have some doubt that whether this is true or false. And at the end, ask the professionals, uh, consult with the fact-checking organizations, see what they have done. If it is a viral fake news, it is most likely that people, the fact-checkers have already fact-checked that. So before sharing, do a little bit, spend a little bit of time and check if it is already fact-checked or not. So before I end, I have one small suggestion um, uh, or one small request, I would say. Before sharing or after reading the headline, before sharing, try to spend some time on the actual article, okay? So I wrote a news headline that didn't even li link to a story, but almost 2,000 people commented on it. And we find that about 59% of people share links on social network without actually clicking on the article. And that is a problem because people can share stuff without knowing what the actual story was. And as I sh showed a couple of examples in my slides, to spend some time, maybe 10 seconds even, uh, read the actual article and then, or even take a glance on the actual article. And then if you want to share the, share the headline or share the story, that will reduce a lot of misinformation on the social network. So always verify before sharing and think about the consequences of your action. So with that, I will uh, end my talk. And if you have any question, please feel free to drop that in the chat box and I'd be happy to take any other questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. I'm Lucy Dalglish. I'm the Dean of the Philip Merrill College of Journalism. And uh, we are really, really pleased to have uh, Dr. Hassan and and Dr. Goldbeck uh, affiliated and, and on our faculty. They are, are brilliant scholars when it comes to news and information. Uh, I now have the privilege of introducing Dr. Sarah Oates, who is, uh, we call her our senior scholar at Philip Merrill College of Journalism. Uh, she is a scholar in the field of political communication and democratization. You've probably seen her quoted everywhere. I think you're going to see her quoted perhaps tomorrow in the Washington Post. Uh, specifically, her work focuses on the way in which traditional media and the internet can either sub support or subvert democracy. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sarah Oates. Thank you, Lucy. Uh for the introduction, um, I'm going to share my screen. And if my fellow panelists could give me a thumbs up, uh, whether they can see it, great. Um, I have a timer going in the corner because we know what scholars are like. And I have to say, senior scholar is starting to mean something else to me over the years, that adjective, uh, but it's still all good. So um, they're a hard act to follow. <laughs> Naimul and Jen, uh, but I'll do my best. And I want to talk about uh, a slightly different level of analysis here. So I'm going to kind of pull back the lens from the platforms and the people and, and talk about the politics. Uh, and it couldn't be really a better year to do that. Um, so I have some good news and I have some bad news about this. I'm a scholar who studied uh, Russia before it was cool. Uh, so for about 30 years now, been looking at Russian and Russian media, never thought it would be the center of the conversation in American politics, uh, but indeed it is. The good news is the Russians uh, are not infiltrating our minds uh, for the, the 2020 elections. Um, yes, there have been a lot of investigations and studies, and we have shown uh, that the Russians, I um, hope you're still seeing the correct screen. Can I get a heads up on that? Or did it just, oh, all right, my bad. I'll put it back. You don't want to, there you go. Okay. My eyes will be a little squinty, but the screen will be in the right place. So that's fine. I got, I got ambitious or the Russians heard me, one or the other, I'm not really sure. Um, so there's been a lot of investigations and studies and there is concern about Russian information operations in the United States, and there should be concern. Uh, it does exist. Uh, that being said, um, it's not really our biggest problem. What is, what is our biggest problem today? Um, I would say the biggest problem is not Russian propaganda, but the Russian playbook. And it's pretty clear that the American right has taken on a lot of the uh, tactics that uh, are very, very familiar to those of us who study Russian propaganda, particularly the four Ds, dismiss, distract, distort, and dismay. And I think all of those tactics are familiar to people through um, seeing some of the news. Now, that being said, 
uh, how you feel about the news kind of depends on which side of the political spectrum you are. And we'll, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. But I want to do a little bit more discussion about what do I mean by Russian political communication? So at the heart of it lies this idea that was beautifully written about by Peter Pomerantsev. He wrote a book uh, with the alluring title of Nothing is True and Everything is Possible. And I have to say, even if you're not interested in Russia and Russian propaganda, he's a beautiful writer and also has a new book out called This is Not Propaganda. Um, so this, this in a way could be a, a Trump slogan, nothing is true and everything is possible. It's an alluring idea. Uh, it's not particular. it's more about, um, excuse me, it's more about hope and faith as opposed to fact. And that's always been a part of the political communication world. But in, in Trump's world, it's, it's really accelerated to the point where uh, he's often completely divorced from fact. Um, now, that's not to say that people don't have criticisms on the left and, and um, you know, like any good political scientist, I do. But I have to say that Trump has shown himself particularly dedicated to this Kremlin tactic, that image is more important than truth. And when we live in this world that's also fueled by the particular affordances that, that Jen and Naimul have talked about of the online world, where we as individuals are relatively disempowered, it's a heady mix and it's difficult to say. And I wanna say, it's not that all of his supporters buy into this or that, that Trump supporters are in some way homogenous because I think that that's a mistake and, and dismissive of particularly of people who have, um, you know, who don't agree fundamentally with the, the democratic ideology. Um, that being said, we now have one country and one election coming up, one big one, and we have two media spheres. So let's take a look at this great site called All Sides. And I really enjoy All Sides. It's just www.allsides.com. And All Sides will take a news topic du jour, in this case, the story of the FBI director um, testifying before Congress today, and it'll give you a headline from the left and from the right. <laughs> I share Nymul's worries about headlines, and I obsessively always read past a headline because I used to be a headline writer for a while. Um, but here from the left, Ray says Russia engaged in very active efforts to interfere in election. And from the right, uh, the Washington Times, which is not actually that far right, um, Antifa is a real thing. Are we even living in the same country on the same day? So what we have that's layered over all these issues of how do we get our news? How do we get through the algorithm? How can we navigate this world? We really have two very separate, what some people would call realities, and what one people would say, what kind of reality on one side, not reality on the other, um, that make it very difficult. So one of the ways I, this, this is a great survey by Pew, uh, Pew Research Center, who, who does some really interesting stuff um, and provides much material for my coursework, which is good. So a survey found that 40% of Trump voters, I think this was in 2017, listed Fox as their main source of news, not particularly surprising. Um, but it was more than all the other news sources they reported, I think, combined. Meanwhile, unsurprisingly again, very few Clinton voters relied on Fox, although 3% said that it was their main source. Um, much more of them relied on CNN. So let's show you a chart. Let's go to the chart. And here you can see, here, this is um, everybody together. Fox News again, good news for Fox, right? 19% dominates. CNN's not too far behind. This was done right after the election, so end of 2016, as it turns out. Here we have Fox voters overwhelmingly, uh, Fox voters, Freudian slip. Here we have Trump voters <laughs> reporting their heavy use of Fox and seeing a distant, distant second. And here, Clinton voters look a little bit more like, you know, we'd expect kind of your average media audience. They're split over um, different medium. And they're actually, uh, the New York Times does make the list. <laughs> so a newspaper gets in there and that's about the, not, not particularly that much, really a toss-up among the other broadcasters. So we know now that people of different political orientations, or at least different preferences for candidates, are not engaging in the same media. Uh, and that's a little bit worrying for America. This, I also throw this up there as a little nerd fest for you. Um, I'll, I'll make these slides available as well. Um, there's a, a really fun free book called Network Propaganda that I recommend as well. And it analyzes millions of news stories. It's this huge project out of MIT. And I think, I think it's out of the Berkman Center. Um, 
that that really shows just how separated we've become as a as a nation. So this this fun chart that actually it kind of looks like a virus spreading. It's not. It's a network analytics chart. Over here in the blue, you can see the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN are dominating as information sources uh, for people um, sharing news on the left. Whereas over here on the right, you've got Breitbart, Truthfeed, Gateway Pundit, and uh, Fox is much smaller. So that you can see that people on the left are using more traditional news sources, where people on the right are using sources that would not be would be considered closer to propaganda than to news in many ways. Um, so again, now for the really fun stuff, and this is actually from um, uh, research by Nathan Calmo and Liliana Mason, our own Liliana Mason, who's here at the University of Maryland. Uh, they looked at well, just how divided are we? Uh, and they found in a, in a little survey in 2019 that almost 20% of the respondents agreed with the statement that their political opponents, quote, lack the traits to be considered fully human. Um, they behave like animals. And uh, slightly more Democrats than Republicans thought the United States would be better off if large numbers of the opposing party in public today just died. So this is disturbing. I mean, the, the social scientists point out that there's always been a lot of animosity um, between among party members. And interestingly, very few uh, political partisans view violence as a good idea. Although interestingly, they view it as a better idea if you won the election than if you've lost the election, which is sort of an interesting comment on human nature that you would, you would turn to violence. But it's a very, very small part. And um, I think that's important because I think that's a narrative that's been mooted. So on that cheerful note, you know, where are we these days? Um, I would say this. I would say, I think the Russians are just throwing a match, or if you like, a Molotov cocktail, into the kerosene of the U.S. audience. You know, without this incredible, and uh, my watch is telling me to stop, <laughs> without this um, incredible and really historic rift among Americans that is exacerbated by um, the different ways in which we're consuming information, and really the two different very realities that we share, the Russian bear is just sticking his paw in and messing with us. But, um, it, and it is an issue, but the issue is more fundamentally and really more fundamentally American than that. So with that, I think I'm at time. So I'll, I'll stop. Thank you, Dr. Oates. Um, we are going to go to questions from our audience. Um, and if you have a question, please put it in the, click on the box at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. And we will try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. I'll also try to keep an eye on the chat because I think um, I think I saw a couple of uh, questions pop up there. But uh, Dr. Oates, why don't you field one while people are starting to type in more questions. Uh, I saw something on the Washington Post homepage today that the FBI director was quoted as saying that the Russians are no longer hacking our election. They're just engaging in disinformation. Now, I was confused by that story, and I was wondering if you could explain to us what's the difference between hacking and disinformation. I don't really know what the difference is in his mind, um, but I would say the word hack is often used in information uh, warfare um, as, as, as a part of like hacking the public consciousness. So I think Russia's attempt to um, inflame and steer narratives uh, to, to push at the wedges is an ongoing and active information war. And I think he's dangerously naive if he thinks that um, the Russians aren't engaged on operational warfare on all fronts. So I would be interested to know what evidence he might have for saying that. But I think um, as much as in, in a sense I tried to contextualize this with the American problems, the Russian threat is real and should be dealt with, and, and the American, the, the government's dismissiveness of it is, is extremely worrying and premature. Okay. Um, the first question from one of our attendees, how do you deal with the fact that so many quality news articles are behind paywalls while fake news articles are usually free and more widely accessible? Obviously, it's worth it to pay for the quality, but a lot of people just won't pay to read one article. Dr. Goldbeck, would you like to uh, take a shot at that one? Man, you are like speaking my language. The LA Times, I would love to read like one article a month from the LA Times and they just block 
clock me out every single time because they've got a pretty tough paywall and I have pretty tough privacy protections, uh, which block advertising. And so I get blocked out of a lot of stuff. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think it's a real problem. Um, uh, you know, at the same time, I don't think that's the source of the disinformation problem uh, as much. You know, I, th I think it's not like, oh, I would, you know, I can't really read this LA Times article, um, but here's one from this super sketchy place. It probably says the same thing. You know, I don't think a lot of people are doing that. And I think this goes to what uh, Sarah was saying, that, that we really see like different sides finding credibility in different sources that, um, you know, it's when we tend to see it, especially on the right here, not that there's not disinformation on the left, but you tend to see a lot of people on the right going to these kind of alternative sources d explicitly because they're not those mainstream sources that might be behind a paywall. Um, and so I, you know, I, I don't see it as the core problem with disinformation. Uh, that said, yeah, I mean, it, it does seem like it's an issue in getting people well informed uh, that, that they can't access these things. And, you know, I think, you know, you in journalism probably know a little bit more about this as real experts of your industry. Um, it's, it's been interesting even just over the last four years, but certainly over, you know, the last 15 to see how journalism has evolved in the face of the ability to share things freely, Google news aggregators, social media. And I, you know, I think the industry of journalism is still kind of figuring out what's the right way to do that. Um, you know, hopefully we see an adaptation that handles that something like metered paywalls or something that allows you to get you know access to some of that content that really interests you um and you know support those organizations through you know whether it's advertising or something else and then uh you know putting up a paywall when people try to access too much i think there's alternatives but i you know as you know much better than me uh journalism's really you know struggling to to deal with their financial models in this space and i think that this is just an aspect of that getting sorted out thank you um wade divini has asked a question that kind of brings back makes me shudder because i remember these episodes so clearly but he says, one of the first things I think of when I hear misinformation is the Stephen Glass crisis at the New Republic back in the late 1990s. I think that was actually closer to 2000. With the internet and overall stronger connections to each other, are news outlets completely safe from another Stephen Glass, Jason Blair? Um, have we plugged the holes in the fact-checking system in the newsrooms enough to ensure there is no information coming out that is knowingly false. Would anyone like to take that a shot at that? Sarah, you're in the journalism school. How about if you? Yeah, um, I, it, what's funny is you're probably the one of the world experts to answer that, Lucy, so you might want to weigh in on that as well. Um, I think that, you know, I, I like to think that things like the, the scandals are the exceptions to the rule and that they, people uh, eventually do get caught because we have norms and ethics in journalism. I don't think you're ever going to have a system where you can completely guard against uh, malicious players or people playing the system. Um, I do think journalists have a, in the United States have a very strong and definable ethical code. Um, and I think this is absolutely critical to maintaining a democracy. Uh, journalism is under attack right now. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's about telling truth to power. Um, and it's interesting because I'm sure Lucy will agree when our students come in, a lot of them already have this orientation and we certainly inculcate it as well. Is anything foolproof? Will we never have another scandal in journalism? I'm going to go crazy here. I'm going to say, no, I don't think that's possible. I, I don't know, Lucy, with your greater no. background in ethics law. No. Yep. What do you think? Not possible. No not possible because uh, journalists are human and there are some humans out there that you know just don't have that inner ethical moral compass um but uh you know news organizations try very very hard to verify it and and uh the reputable ones when something is pointed out to them as being false they correct it to the best of their ability as soon as they possibly can and that's uh, really the biggest difference sometimes between a reputable news organization and just junk on the internet. Um, I, there's an interesting question, maybe, Naomi, you'd like to take this. I work in German media. 
Do you see many international sources in use in this election cycle? Have you noticed that? Okay, yeah. Uh, I haven't noticed uh, many international sources being used in the election cycle, but um, I think Sarah uh, follows more uh, election or US election than me. So if Sarah wants to uh, give her input on it, but I don't follow that much about the US elections. Um, okay, I, I, I admit I, I got into the questions and I was reading and <laughs> I, could you just recap what the question was? Do you see um, much, uh, what is the international, uh, let me find it. Sorry, apologies. Yeah, the, um, do you see much um, coverage internationally of these issues? Oh yeah. Um, now I, I, I know that um, of, of the issues of, of the divisiveness within American society, the issues of, of the problems within social media companies and needing regulation. Um, yes, I think, I think other things have overwhelmed, interestingly. Who, who would have thought that the election wasn't going to be the biggest story of 2020 in America and elsewhere? Um, but, you know, but that's, I speak just as a consumer of international media. I don't speak as a scholar, but I think the whole world is pretty galvanized by these issues. I'm going to um, ask Dr. Golbeck to answer the next question. Uh, major media, social media sites like Facebook, you know, have been, um, sorry, my computer just hid the question. Okay. Uh, major uh We've been seeing a lot of leaders of you know, Facebook, Twitter, social media sites uh, testifying before Congress and people are trying to get a handle on this, but these companies say that they're stepping up fact checking by adding additional information to posts. Uh, do you think this is effective? Do you think it has a chance of being effective? I mean, I think generally, especially from Facebook, it's a bunch of nonsense. Uh, Facebook has been so interesting to watch over the last, you know, four years since there was the the first concerns that came up right after the last election and the pushback that they were getting. I mean, they have straight up lied about the kind of things that they've done. They lied about Cambridge Analytica and how data got out. Uh, no, we didn't release anyone's data. Oh, it was a data breach. Like, it was just uh, straight out untrue. And any of us who were able to access data at that time, which I was, I, I pulled data in the same way that Cambridge Analytica did, and I just wasn't evil with it. Everybody knew that that was doable. Uh, you know, they've lied repeatedly about it. And when they feel like they're going to get called, especially in the context of the election, they say that they're going to do things. They say they're taking these steps, um, but they're not. You know, I and we've seen it from smart people within Facebook doing research that they have identified problems either with the algorithms, they've identified ways to apply fact checking. Uh, somebody outside Facebook complains about it and Facebook step backs and says they're not gonna do anything. So I, you know, I think in general, especially from them, um, you know, there's, there's nothing reliable <laughs> that they're doing in this space. Overall, um, if we look at social media, so say Twitter, you know, putting some alerts on Trump's tweets. I mean, I'm pleased that they're doing that. It's something. And, and you know, once Twitter finally took that step, I think we saw the other social media companies all step forward to do it. Does it matter? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it, I, I think the people who are Trump supporters, uh, you know, some of whom are in my family and we I think fortunately don't discuss this because it doesn't go well, um, they don't care right? Facebook or Twitter, if they put an alert on that, like they're just part of the problem, right? They're part of the enemy and they're going to believe what Trump is saying. Um, and I think the the people who are going to respond well to those alerts probably wouldn't necessarily believe what Trump is saying in the first place. So, you know, I think it's important, and, and this kind of comes back to what I, I said in the talk, I think there's some responsibility on these platforms, especially because with these algorithms, they're editing and curating the information that we see, that they, they do have to take some responsibility for fact checking, for, uh, you know, putting some context to help us with it. So, I, you know, I think that's good, but I think in the particular case of this election and Trump's statements, which is where we're seeing it, I don't anticipate that it's gonna make a, a huge difference just because of how polarized we are. Could I leap in on that? I'm gonna be even tougher than Jen and say, <laughs> Jen and I, Mool and I and others could, we could sit down, we could go to Facebook tomorrow and say, here's a hundred different things you could do 
to weed out disinformation, hate speech, incitement to violence on your platforms. And they could do it within 24 to 72 hours. They're not going to. And that's frustrating um, because, you know, Naimul and Jen and I can just study this till the cows come home and warn you about it and tell you about it. Um, but there's a real disconnect between the social media companies engaging with academics and, and even policymakers. Um, and they've been a real black box. And I think, um, and I hope that needs to change. I mean, just to, in, I don't want us to dominate on this, but just to, to play off what Sarah said there, um, there was a Wall Street Journal investigation that pulled internal documents from Facebook, where Facebook found that something like 80% of people who join alt-right groups on Facebook do so because Facebook recommended those groups to them as something that they join. So Facebook knows that they are driving people towards this extreme content that advocates for violence, that advocates, uh, that shares all kinds of conspiracies, known fake news sites. There's databases of these out there. It's all over. And Facebook explicitly said, we're not going to bother doing research in this anymore, and we're not going to do anything about it. So they know they've identified internally the problems that their algorithm are creating and they have made the explicit decision not to do anything about it um, and I mean Sarah's right like I, after the 2016 election I was like here's five things that Facebook could do there's known fake news sites right there's lists of them just make it so they don't show those previews and you can't click on it like you can go ahead and share that URL it shows up here's the URL somebody has to copy and paste it they can click on it but Facebook doesn't have to support that and encourage it by showing the previews and the headlines and whatever. That would solve a huge part of this problem. And it's literally one line of code. It would be so simple to implement, but they don't want the pushback from the, from the people who like those sites and they're not gonna do it. So I, they're just too cowardly to take any steps. And, and they don't wanna take the legal responsibility under section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. I, I mean, it's such a huge- They get sure. involved in it the more responsibility they take for it and they become legally responsible for it, which they are not at the moment. They're, they're trying very hard to maintain that. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's a problem, but you know, Lucy, as Sarah said, this is your area of expertise, but I, I don't think they should be exempt given the role the algorithms play. Yes. Um, let's move on to ask a question from the perspective of the right. And um, a quest, uh, one of our guests asks, what can mainstream news organizations do to improve their credibility among those on the right? Anyone want to jump in on that? I, I think there's no question that a lot of folks from the right perspective do not trust mainstream news organizations. Yeah, I, I think um, the, the standard response to that among journalists, because journalists get that question a lot, has been, we just want to keep doing our job telling, being balanced, you know, trying to uh, tell truth to power. And of course, from the right perspective, um, they're saying, well, no, you have this leftist narrative and you're not including voices. So it's tough. I mean, you have, you have a couple of different choices. You can become um, advocacy journalism, which you see on the right, but you become advocacy on the left. So you just have sort of advocacy versus advocacy. You know, as a, from a social science point of view, if you were a local newspaper, I would see a role for focus groups and discussions and a two-way dialogue about, because I think if you unpacked it and say, well, what do you not like about our coverage? What, what do you find alienating? I think that would be a good conversation to have. But that's about as much as I can think of. Well, we have time for one more question, and I'm going to ask each one of you to address it. Um, to, uh, from Shelby Scott and to all the panelists, as academics, what is our responsibility to correct misinformation outside our field? As an example, should we stay in our own lane? Um, Naimal, would you like to? Uh, yeah, so uh, even if uh, I'm working on, let's say, data mining, and that's my field, for example, I am socially responsible to fact check something about uh, COVID-19. So uh, if I know that this is misinformation based on my reading from uh, reliable sites from CDC, I have the responsibility to uh, let other people know that there is a, this is a misinformation. So I don't have to be an expert on COVID-19 to find an information uh, about COVID-19 from reliable sources. 
and at least I can play that part. I can play that role, even if I'm working on let's say data mining or other technology in the area. Now, uh, so at least that should be uh, done from uh, my ethical point of view or from my responsibility to the society. Thank you. Um, Dr. Oates, would you like to be next? Sure, I'd never stay in your lane. No, um, I, I, I just think in life and right now, um, I mean, get ready if you're gonna correct someone, you know, put your hand out in Twitter, you may draw back a bloody stump. Um, but I think graceful, um, polite engagement is just desperately needed now. And I encourage everyone to, to try that as much as one can. Dr. Goldbeck. Yeah, I mean, I'll say I, I've kind of taken a hybrid approach. Like I have very uh, strong opinions about the things I do research on and on social media. I spend a lot of time putting those forward. Uh, but I'm also trained as a scientist and as an information scholar. So I'm much better than the average person at interpreting scientific studies and at finding sources or information about if this is reliable or not. Um, so I say everything I want about the stuff I study and, and put my own opinions out there pretty clearly and have taken the position that when I engage on other things, I tend to be extremely fact-based. So I'll come in and correct, but say, you've misinterpreted this study, here's what this means, um, and keep my opinions out of it as much as possible uh, and, and kind of just here's here's the facts of it here's how to interpret this here's what it means uh which doesn't keep me from getting the bloody stumps i get them all the time <laughs> uh on social media but uh, you know i i think every approach is valid but for me that's been one where my opinion you know i share in the spaces where i absolutely know more than anybody else on earth and then i you know i try to share my literacy in the other spaces thank you that's about all the time we have for tonight. A big thank you to my co-moderator, Dr. Keith Marzullo from the, the iSchool, uh, and to Drs. Goldbeck, Hassan, and Oates. Uh, thank you for sharing your research and your expertise with us. And I'd like to thank all of our guests uh, who listened in tonight and watched our presentation. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. And please be sure to check out our upcoming UM Democracy, I think that's how we're saying it, UMD Democracy events at Terps slash UM Democracy. Uh, so uh, good evening, everyone. And this is being recorded. I, you'll be able to refer uh, your friends and colleagues to it on both the websites of Philip Merrill College and the iSchool's website. So. Thanks everybody and have a nice evening.